No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you'll always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great program, and here's what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, which consists of a scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today, we'll be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, a passage that gives us a sobering warning about what we believe in religious matters. So get out your Bibles, turn to 2 Timothy 4. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Roger Campbell answers the question, how can we make sure that we are not deceived by false religious messages? Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about an airplane crash. Then we'll head over to the pastime porch where Joe Guy is waiting for us, and he'll be talking about having confidence in our prayers. Chad Dollahide joins us for just a minute, and he's pointing us to the guidance that God has left for us. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin. During the Lord's Supper, do the bread and fruit of the vine turn into Christ's actual blood and flesh? That's a great question, and one that many people are confused about. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to 2 Timothy 4, where we read, beginning at verse number 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The book of 2 Timothy is Paul's final inspired letter, and he's written this to the young preacher, Timothy. And here in chapter 4, the last chapter of the book, he's giving some of his final thoughts and final directions to Timothy. The chapter began with Paul telling Timothy to preach the Word, to convince, to rebuke, to exhort the, the Christians that he was working with. So our text that we have today is answering the why Timothy should be doing these things. Why is he to spend so much time and effort preaching the Word, uh, to be convincing, rebuking, and exhorting the brethren? Well, our passage begins telling us the time is coming when sound doctrine just won't be endured anymore. People aren't going to want to hear the truth. The majority won't put up with the proper teaching, the sound teaching of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, we read about the straight and narrow way and the, that leads to everlasting life, and the broad way, many go that way, that leads to destruction. These are people who are trying to get toward heaven. The broad way are the people who are going the wrong direction. Those are the people uh, who are... Uh, 
not enduring sound doctrine. Those are the people headed in the wrong direction. You see, the gospel truth isn't good enough for them. They want something else. The straight and narrow that leads to heaven, that's difficult. So we shouldn't be surprised uh, when we see false teaching going on. We were warned many, many times in Scripture that was going to happen. There was going to be false teaching that would lead people to destruction. This flies into the face of that belief that, that you can believe whatever you want, or there's many different roads to get us to heaven. That's not a biblical concept at all. You see, people will no longer endure sound doctrine. That's what he's talking about here. They're, they're being led by their own desires because of having itching ears. People are hearing what they want to hear. Uh, and, and this is being driven by their demand. The people, this is what they're wanting. This is nothing new. Jeremiah talked about that in chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, where he prophesied, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Or how about this from Isaiah 30.10? Say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. You see, they heaped up for themselves, teachers, just like the people in the New Testament time heaping up for themselves, teachers. These are no real teachers. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7, 15. They're heaping them up. There won't be a shortage of men willing to speak false things. They've got them in heaps. Or as we might say today, they're a dime a dozen. A lot of people will do that, will speak deceitful things just to build themselves up. Some for financial gain some out of pride. John warns us in 1 John 4 verse 1 that many false prophets have gone out into the world. And the people, they've turned their ears from the truth. They've stopped listening to what's true and spend all their time listening to false messages. You see, when you fill up your time with false messages, there's no room for true things. Truth requires things of us, and people don't like that. False teaching gives us what it is that we already want for ourselves. That's the difference between these two. And that's why Timothy's been charged, preach the truth, preach the word. People are going to be turning aside to fables. They're no longer headed on that straight and narrow path, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. They're following a false path. And the sad thing is, oftentimes, they don't realize it. It sounds good to them. The itching ears, they want to hear this. So what are we to do with this? Well, we've got to be very, very careful that we take, uh, take in only what's proper. Check everything you hear with the Word of God to make sure these things are so. And as you do that, consider the context of the passage. Like John 3.16, is that teaching faith only? Oh, no. Earlier in the chapter, he talks about being born of water and the Spirit. Oh, why does he talk about the serpent from Numbers 21 just before that? You have to do what you're told in order to be saved. What about Acts 22, verse 16, where we're told to call on the name of the Lord for salvation? Well, turns out baptism is right in that very verse. We have to look at the context. The good news is, if you want it, truth is attainable, but you need to want it so bad that you're going to challenge everything you hear, and then you will find it. And that's good news for us today. Now, Roger Campbell is going to talk to us about a very important subject, protecting ourselves from false religious messages. Be ready always. What can you and I do to, to make sure that we're not deceived by false religious messages? As we study the New Testament, we find in a number of letters written to Christians, they were exhorted, be not deceived. Now, if someone deceives us by false teaching, they're going to be held accountable for that. 
But you and I also have a responsibility to make certain that we're not pulled aside or pulled astray by false religious messages. So what can we do to avoid that? I want to mention two things. Number one is learn, and number two is love. In order to avoid being pulled away by false religious messages, we need to learn the truth. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, John chapter 5 and verse 39. The people who lived in the city of Berea in the first century, that's exactly what they did. The Bible says in Acts 17 and verse 11 that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. We're reminded of what John wrote to Christians. He said, believe not every spirit, that is, don't fall for everything that you hear, but try or test the spirits whether they are of God, for there are many false prophets gone out into the world, 1 John 4 and verse number 1. So how would we do that today? How would we put the teaching that we read or hear from a human to the test? The answer is we'd compare it to the scriptures. So we're back to that responsibility on our part to learn what the scriptures say. But a second aspect of avoiding being deceived by false religious messages is the need to love the truth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read about those who are going to be deceivers and a warning for the brethren not to be deceived by them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 10, the Bible says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In order for them to be saved, they needed to have a love for the truth. When that love for the truth was lacking, they would not obtain salvation. The next verse, verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And so you've got a contrast. In verse 11, you've got the idea of believing a lie. In verse 12, believing the truth. In order for us to avoid being pulled aside by false religious messages, we need to learn the truth and then love that truth and then take our stand on what God's Word has to say. We recall what happened with Eve. The serpent told her if she ate from of that particular tree, that she wouldn't die. She heard a lie. She believed a lie. She acted upon that lie, and the result was a disaster. How can you and I avoid being deceived by false religious messages? Two key ingredients. Number one, learn the truth. And number two, love the truth and take our stand right there. I'm Roger Campbell, and this has been Be Ready Always. Those were two simple concepts, learn and love. Thanks, Roger. Now grab some paper and something to write with, and you can write down our contact information. If you haven't yet enrolled in our free Bible course, contact us to get started. It's a great way to implement that New Year's resolution to improve your Bible study this year. Remember, all of our courses are given free of charge. We won't try to sell you anything, and we won't pester you with solicitations. Jim Dearman joins us in just a moment. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. Always good news. 
We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. The easiest way to enroll in our Bible course is on our website at gnttv.org. Just click where it says Bible course, fill out the information, and we'll mail it to you. We're pleased to partner with Truth.fm to bring you a 24-7 stream of Good News Today right on their website. In addition to the Good News Today channel, they also have several others that all contain excellent Bible lessons. The truth is always being preached at Truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about an airplane crash. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. There's a true story of an airplane that went down in the Everglades. As it approached for a landing, there was a problem with the landing gear light in the cockpit. The pilot radioed the tower and decided to make another pass. Soon all of the cockpit crew had turned their attention to this apparently malfunctioning light. As they all worked on the problem with the landing gear, they neglected their regular duties and the plane crashed. Now what's the lesson for us? We too sometimes turn our attention from our most important responsibilities. We allow ourselves to become encumbered with things that seem like they are of the greatest urgency, all the while neglecting the things that most need our attention. Solomon wrote, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. No matter how important the responsibilities of life may appear, if they turn one's attention from doing this, we're headed for a crash. We will live eternally if we obey Let's keep focused on God and obeying His commands. Thanks for that, Jim. Have you ever missed an episode of Good News Today and wish you could watch it? Here are a few ways that you can do that. Our website or our YouTube channel, or if you download our app, you can watch on your phone or tablet. If you download the Roku or Apple TV app, you can watch it on your television. That program is there every Sunday morning, so you never have to miss an episode. Now it's time to head over to the Pastime Porch, where Joe Guy is waiting for us with more truths from the Timeless Text. He's talking to us today about having confidence in our prayers. Well, thanks for stopping by. You know, I have a little hearing loss in one of my ears, I guess from too many years around gun ranges. Stephanie reminds me a lot that I can't hear what she's saying. It's strange, she says, that my deaf ear always seems to be on the side that she's sitting on. When you pray, do you ever wonder if God is listening? And did you know that you can pray in certain ways that God is more likely to hear you and even to answer your prayers? 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15 tells us we should have confidence or a feeling of reliability and truthfulness and trust in our prayers. John says, if we ask anything in accordance to His will, that He hears us, if we place our requests in the context of what God knows is best and for His future plans, whether or not we know them or can understand them, He promises to hear us. In chapter 3, verses 21 through 22, John tells us we can only have this confidence if our hearts do not condemn us. We can't expect God to hear us if we haven't shown our obedience and submission to Him. John says He hears us because we, number one, keep His commandments, and number two, we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. In Psalms 34, verses 15 through 18, it shows that God's eyes are open to the righteous and He hears them, but His face is against the wicked. God hears the righteous cry out and helps them. For God is near to those who have a broken heart and who have a contrite or crushed spirit. James also advises us to be confident in our prayers, to pray when we're suffering, to pray for the sick, and to pray for the forgiveness for others who have confessed their sins there in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13, Jesus tells us to be humble in our prayers, to be more focused on speaking to God than making a show in front of other people, and to pray for things such as the furtherment of God's kingdom, for our daily food and blessings, for our forgiveness, and for deliverance from temptation and troubles. We can ensure that God hears us by remaining faithful 
not just when we think we need Him. Praying in accordance with His greater will. Praying for the right things and with the correct spirit. Praying constantly, not just when we need something. Isn't it better just to trust the timeless text when it tells us and what it tells us about praying? I'm Joe Guy. Thank you for visiting. Our behavior affects God's reception of our prayers. That's something important to keep in mind. Thanks, Joe. We've got a great way for you to start every day, and that's with the Good News Today Daily Devotional Time podcast, available wherever you get your podcast. Chad Dalahite is going to join us for just a minute as he points us toward the guidance that God has left. May I have just a minute of your time? Some folks' idea of God's guidance for man today is like the air traffic controller I heard about who had two planes coming in, one from the south, one from the north. The man gave both planes permission to land on runway one. Second pilot radioed back to the tower and said, didn't you just give that other plane permission to land on runway one? The air traffic controller answered, yes, sir. Y'all take care now. (laughs) Jesus did not ascend back into heaven and just give us a y'all take care now for all mankind. He sent the Holy Spirit to the apostles, to the other inspired writers, and they gave us the New Testament. The New Testament is not man's words, It's God's, and it provides all we need for life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3. God did not leave us on our own. We have guidance in the New Testament. Knowing God has left us a guide, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you consulted His Word for guidance? I'm Chad Dalahut, and this is Just a Minute. All the guidance we need is right there in the Bible. In just a moment, we'll have a Bible question. During the Lord's Supper, do the bread and fruit of the vine turn into Christ's actual blood and flesh? Hey, Troy, have you ever eaten anything that as you eat it, it changes? Yes, actually. There's different different types of foods that you don't expect, but whenever you eat it, it does have a different texture or changes. In Texas, I ate some corn, and it was really good, but I didn't know what I was eating. It was like it kept changing because the way it was flavored. Oh, wow. It was spicy. But it was sweet. That, yeah. And it was salty. Yeah. And, and it's like my mouth didn't know what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe an indirect way to introduce today's question, but it says during the Lord's Supper, do the bread and fruit of the vine turn or change into Christ's actual blood and flesh? Oh, well, let's just answer the question real quickly. No. No, <laughs> it does not. And this is a question that has been debated for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. There's a lot of religious confusion around this very topic. Well, you know, 1 Corinthians 11 and the institution of the Lord's Supper, when Jesus says, this is my body, Mm -hmm. this is my blood. Well, we need to realize at that point in time, that wasn't his physical body. It was bread that he had taken that is symbolic or represents. And then... The fruit of the vine was not his literal blood. And so when they drank it, there's nothing in that context to indicate that it turned into it. He's using that as symbolism. That's exactly right. In fact, you can go back before that in John chapter 6, whenever he was teaching about him being the bread. And he says in John chapter 6, verse 53, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He's standing right before them 
and saying these things. And of course, you see later on that they were confused about it. What do you mean eating flesh and drinking blood? Like you said, symbolism. He explains when you, the bread, it stands for that. Um, you know, and some people get hung up, you know, well, it doesn't say represent, it says is. Well, good symbolism, you don't have to always say like or as. That's correct. Um, it stands for it. And so, you know, does it literally change? There's not a single verse in scripture that tells us that somehow when you eat of it or drink of it, it turns into his literal flesh or blood. Exactly. And just think about the logic behind that. I mean, the Bible uses all kinds of figurative language, sim- symbolism in different ways. For example, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says that to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I don't know about you, Gotten, but I'm pretty sure, you know, that my wife doesn't wash clothes in blood. You don't wash things with blood. But what is that? It's symbolism. Well, and do we literally come in contact with that blood? Well, if I take my key and I say, here's the key to my car. Uh-huh. This is my life. Oh, okay. Does that mean that's literally my life? No, it's symbolism. You would understand that to yeah. mean what? It means a lot to me. It means a lot, yeah. And it would emphasize about the care and the emphasis uh, that you ought to give towards you know the responsibility I'm giving you. And that's what he's doing to Jesus, uh, right. to his disciples, is Jesus saying, this is my blood, yeah. this is my body. And it's symbolic. And, and and even then, what is that symbolism? It's about the sacrifice there you go. and the redemption that we obtain through it. That's the most important thing. And still, instead of focusing on things like that one word, it says it is, you know, focus on what's the purpose. What is the purpose of taking and consuming those those elements of the Lord's Supper? What's the purpose of the blood and things like that? Exactly. So... Uh, great question. We appreciate you asking it, but is uh, does it change? There's not a single verse to support that, so our answer is no. Amen. Today we've dealt with several false teachings. It may be the case that this isn't what you've been taught before. Check us against the Word of God. Check everything you hear against the Word of God, Acts 17, 11. Even if you hear it on our program. And if you need to listen to it again, you can do that. Have some extra time to check the scriptures. Write these things down and make sure it's so. You can do that through our website, through our apps, or through our podcast. If you still have a question, contact us. We'd love to hear from you. We might even answer your question on the program. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. Good news, good news, there is good news today. Good news, good news, the world always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. All around the world, good news, always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today.